Welcome to the Tennis Hackery podcast. This is the place where we discuss all things about tennis related to technology, the brain game, and fitness. So it's really all about uh, wholesome tennis. My name is Tarun, and we have a full house here with Soham and Alex joining us. We are a group of extremely passionate uh, San Francisco Bay Area based tennis geeks slash coaches. Today is episode four. Uh, it's all about, it's a two part series actually. And it's all about one of the foundations of tennis hacker, which is the brain game. So we are really going to go dive deep into mental tennis. Uh, uh, before we get started, a quick uh, uh, spiel on you know the marketing stuff. So please follow us on our socials. At Tennis Hackery is our uh, social handle. So you can find us on Instagram, on X, which used to be called Twitter, Meta, which Facebook. You we have a all these videos will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, again, at Tennis Hackery. The podcast, the audio version will go to Spotify. Uh, it, it, eventually, we are going to get on other podcasting platforms as well, like Apple and, you know, the Google Play Store, Podbean, etc. cetera. So, uh, so, yes, please like, subscribe, comment, and leave us reviews. And as for our website, uh, so if you go to tennishackery.com, you will again see a nice little piggy which shows that it's, I, the, the point of mentioning the piggy is that it is legit. So our website is not up yet. So the pig is still out there, but we are not. So, but in a few weeks, we, we our, the website will be live. All right. Uh, without further ado, let me stop yapping and cede the stage to Soham and our rockstar coach, Alex. Take it away, guys. Well, thanks, Tarun, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I honestly wish I could be like you when I grow up. Um, <laughs> grow up? I, I, You're already I, I grown up. up. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. do enjoy your yeah. enthusiasm always at the start of every episode. And honestly, uh, you do a really good job. So we are very thankful to have you. Hey. Um, but in terms of uh, the episode four, first of all, I want to say that, you know, we really appreciate all the love that we're getting from episode three, we had a huge increase in the number of subscribers to our YouTube channel, as well as Instagram, and uh, hopefully other social media platforms as well. So keep uh, keep pouring in with your love and gratitude, and we will continue to deliver all the, all the good stuff um, and good content uh, going forward, um, which brings us to episode four. Like Tarun said, it's about the uh, mental aspects of tennis and it's it's something that I've been very very excited about this episode um, I've been thinking about so many things that we can say there's there's a lot of material that we can talk about including uh, resources uh, that you know you can read up on including um, a bunch of a variety of things um, so we're trying to cover as much as we can and uh, like Tarun said, it's also kind of a two-part episode because, again, there's so much material. Uh, we don't want to bore you, bore our listeners to death by doing two-hour special epi episodes. So we'll break it up into two. So um, starting with mental tennis or rather the brain game, the mindset, uh, there's a lot of synonyms or words that we can use for this Um and uh, including, you know, the attitude, the mind, self-awareness, uh, the emotional quotient, uh, strategy. A lot of these uh, things are involved in mental mental part of tennis. It's it's something that I I really enjoy this part of tennis. So for me, one of the reasons I play tennis is not just for the physical fitness because I love to be active. I'm very outdoorsy, and of course, tennis as well as soccer are my two favorite sports. And um, besides the physical fitness that is so important in the sport, the mental aspect of the game is something that I really, really enjoy. It's an opportunity for me to learn, uh, learn from my opponents, learn from the different styles, uh, try to figure out, try to solve problems during the match, and for that, I have to be. I have to be very disciplined. I have to be very focused. Uh, the focus is on the opponent, not on myself. Um, I have to um, figure out ways I need to win. Sometimes you win ugly, like Brad Gilbert has uh, as a as a person out there. 
Um, so it doesn't have to be pretty, but you know, a win is a win. So you figure out ways to win. And all of these things, to win a match, to construct points and win points is all mental, according to me. We all have uh, fundamentals, technicals, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, vary from person to person. But um, fascinating for me is studying the opponent, visualization of the court and the trajectory of the, of the tennis ball and just, you know, using some sort of an IQ uh, to, to crack or to hack hack the game you know as as our as our, as our that's the word yeah <laughs> for that we need the mind uh i want to i want to uh hand it over to our rock star like tarun said alex to talk about what is why do you play tennis alex and what aspects of the mental game does does like intrigue you does, does like what's so intriguing about the uh, mental aspects of tennis Oh, so much. Um, I'm going to answer the why, um, what intrigues me about the mindset and the mental aspect about tennis. Well, as a tennis player, um, what intrigues me is finding a new way every single time. There's always a new way. There is always a way, not that you're always going to win, um, but there are always lessons involved and uh, it's the way you need to play against your opponent. It's the way you need to handle your own emotions. It's the way you need to learn how to handle the distractions that are happening or whatever challenges coming your way. Um, it, tennis is so challenging. Matches are so challenging. You're all alone out there. Um, you might have your parents watching or it might be your teammates. It might be a coach. It might be just... The, the people from your opponent that are annoying you, you know, there's always so much going on. Or grandstand at the um, US Open. <laughs> well, then, yeah. <laughs> but even in the smaller versions, yes. it can be yeah. very mental. Yeah. yeah. Very mental. And and I think as a, I mean, as a player, like it's your own journey, right? So it's, it's exciting. It's like connection to yourself. It's a way to get to know yourself more. You really get to see where you struggle. You really get to see where you're, pretty gifted at or very good at and then it becomes this journey of like improving with your strengths and your weaknesses as a coach I find it uh, I don't know if I find it more fascinating but I definitely find it just as fascinating um, because you get to see it with other people and you get to see how big of a deal it is and like it's not just with kids it's with adults it's with anyone it's like how how much are they owning their own game um and what what is going on are they are they fixed or do they have a growth mindset and like so that goes back to the the book carol dweck mindset and i really like that book because a fixed mindset is like if you're you think you're good or bad at something and it's just already predetermined and a growth mindset is like you're just open to learn and like i would say you guys are very growth mindset oriented and it was actually one of the big reasons that I was like this is great for me because as a tennis coach that has already been doing this for so long it's super easy to become a fixed mindset coach because it's like you've done it this way you're already getting some credit this way you're getting clients very easily so um and you're definitely like the growth mindset and the fixed mindset you're not either or completely um, for example, I think I'm growth mindset oriented as a tennis player mostly, but then if the way I talk about my back end, I have a long way to go with becoming more of a growth mindset in that. Um, and I think it's important to learn this as a coach, like to help your students more and as parents or as anyone helping other people, learning to educate them with a growth mindset. Absolutely, Alex. You you bring so many valuable uh, points that you hit, and very grateful for the education that we're getting on this on this subject. I mean, I want to talk about how I feel. Like I always, when I coach, you know, I, there are a few things that I always tell my students, and it also applies to me actually. One of the thing is, you know, tennis is a game. It, tennis is very similar to chess. It's mindset. It's like very logical. Um, you know, you you kind of have to 
uh, think about steps, uh, two steps ahead of your opponent. It's a lot of visualization. It's a lot of strategy. And that's why I enjoy it because I'm, I'm really, even, even at my work, yeah. there's a lot of uh, strategic thinking and, and from a leadership perspective that I do. So I really, really enjoy that. And honestly, it's the growth mindset for me is so key because as a person on a daily basis, I'm all, all continuously trying to learn. Even today, I play tennis for two, three hours, irrespective of where I am in my tennis journey. For me, I, I love the game so much and I'm very realistic about my level. So every day that I step on court, for me, it's like an opportunity for me to learn something different because I was listening to some reel that Ro Roger Federer was talking about uh, and even, even Andre Agassi. I think I shared this with you the other day, uh, Alex. You know, like it, it's, it's to be successful, there are a few things that you need. One is you need to have that drive and motivation, which comes from within, which is very hard to coach. Um, then, then, you know, when you, you have to be disciplined, you have to be a hard worker. Um, and, you know, you, you want to be hung, you, you have to be hungry. But aside from all this, uh, you need certain type of pe positive people around you. I, I really feel like having positive people around you in life, and this doesn't just apply to tennis, uh, is, is crucial for you to see positivity in every situation, like uh, think of the glass half full, basically, right? Um, even in even in situations during a match, for example, in tennis, you could be losing, but you could have a very positive outcome, which is why Rafa Nadal is my my idol in a lot of ways. Attitude, his very like strong mind, and always he has the belief that even if he's down, he can come back and win. To me, that's fascinating. That's something that attracts me about tennis. And I have tried to adopt that into my game because very honestly, personal story here is one of the reasons why I was initial, initial like early on in, in my tennis journey that I was not able to finish off matches or, you know, lot, like try to like come back in matches is because I wasn't mentally strong. I, I may have had physical fi physical fitness and that drive to to win, but I realized very quickly that those things are just one aspect of it. But strengthening strengthening the mind, whether it comes from experience of playing a variety of players, variety of being in variety of situations, um, different surfaces, you know, uh, different environment, all of that play a role in making you much more uh, like tougher mentally. And besides that, one of the other things which I spoke about in episode one of introduction, what, one of the things that I learned is being very realistic about where you are at and your capabilities and sort of the what you have in your toolbox in terms of your skills in tennis. Because those things actually make a difference when you make, make, start making decisions during a match. So um, all of these things play a vital role uh, in keeping you mentally grounded and um, having the right people around you is so vital yeah, because it is so important. Yeah, positivity. Positivity is important, but having the right set of people who are tell who are who are honest, yeah. who are realistic, and they're keeping like they're giving a reality check. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's that's key because for me that's what happened and literally after covid my performance improved i was mentally strong i was coming back from matches i lost a lot of first sets but i came back because i started playing points one just just being in the moment being present and just playing one point at a time and not worrying about the outcome yep. and just kind of being happy on the court and for me, that was a big shift mentally. And I saw the results. And today, I feel one of my strengths is actually being mentally tough. And I have to attribute a lot of that to some of my close friends who are exceptionally mentally strong. And Alex, this is where I would love to ask you about your experiences while being on the tour or your like matches. Like, 
what are your experiences have you had kind of a breakdown and you came back like do you do meditation like what are your rules that you undertake to strengthen your mind hmm. well i mean when i look back like when i played um college tennis and and even before that like i i had a sports psychologist and even though i wasn't very aware of like what um goal oriented process oriented or results oriented meant as much then or i was just not as uh mature and aware yet but um i did already have that so it was already like slowly being instilled in me i i was like a a player that was very hard on myself um so i really needed the help i needed the sports psychologist and and i was lucky i had some coaches that were very um very good that that knew that it was all about process um because you're going to feel the results like you're going to have the rankings you're going to have the pressure you're going to have the people or whoever is like results oriented around you you're going to have that in your environment so you really do need to seek that out and and it's extremely important um i might have already mentioned this but i remember the biggest lesson that i really have learned when it comes to my mental game is like when i have expectations that's when it goes wrong and so if i expect that i need to do really well or if i have this ranking that i need to achieve it it brings everything out, outside of me it's like uh, nothing else matters anymore i can only see this way and it's not in my control because i have an opponent yeah. i don't know how i play that day i don't know the conditions maybe it's a terrible matchup like there's so much going on and it's not a win-win because like if i lose i can still win if i'm improving but if i only look at results like there is no win there's no possible win except for i have to win right mm -hmm. and so that's really learning to buy into process yep. um it's much harder to do it for yourself than as a coach with your players um so for me like i meditate um if i have anything like a match or a tournament or anything that like I feel pressure. So it doesn't need to even be tennis. Um, I visualize how I would like it to go. I visualize, I try to visualize, I don't always do it, but my, I do well when I visualize um, how I would like to be, how I would like to act, how I would like to feel. Right. Um, so th those are really the, that's a, that's my, my journey with it and where I'm at right now is that I really, like meditation, just even like laying down 10 minutes when I feel like I'm feeling a lot of pressure. Right. Um, if I have something that is just like, gosh, I really want to perform well because like that, that anxiety for performance, yeah. that's what I really feel like it is. It's performance anxiety. That could be like a presentation. That could be uh, you go on a date. It could be, it could be anything. Right. And I think that like meditation, like just laying down, quieting down your, your mind, visualization like i said um and then having those positive people like you said so am having them around you and and calling them up if you're struggling um yeah yep that's amazing definitely definitely i mean totally agree with you and i i, I do want to uh, make a couple of uh, additions in terms of my routine what i do nowadays at least to be prepared for matches and basically to take care of the mental state of mind you know i before matches i usually take a nap for about 30 minutes or so uh, about two hours before my match because it relaxes my muscles you know uh kind of get some fresh air i open the windows in my room i just i just want to make sure that i'm breathing properly i'm relaxed i'm calm because usually i play a lot of intense singles matches where um it's very up and down it's like tense uh, and and there's a lot of effort and energy because I kind of grind. That's my style of play. So I need to conserve as much energy because it can get mentally, physically exhausting, but also mentally draining. And I've been in a lot of those kind of matches. It actually has toughened me up a lot. So I'm very thankful and grateful That's for it. Nice. And the other thing that I do is, especially when I'm driving to the matches, sometimes it's a little bit far, but even if it's like a 20, 25 minute drive, I play a lot of like high energy music. I, I, I need that. Like I love music. I'm into music a lot, 
but music when I'm driving, when I'm walking into the court, and I've seen a lot of pros actually have. Yeah, they they, they come with these headphones. Yep, yep, yep. And for me, like I love music so much, and I need that energy. Like it, it needs. I need that uh, motivate more than motivation. It's that feeling of, um, uh, like I guess positive energy is the best way I can express it, and I get that from music. Yep. So those are a couple of the things that I usually do. And of course, we have already spoken about like preparation before court, like, you know, uh, stretching and those kind of things and proper nutrition and all of that stuff, hydration. What I really want to talk about and uh, one of the things that I've observed amongst my some of my peers at a recreational level is one of the, this is more of the negative thing that I want to bring out is there is for some people there is this concept that they're scared to lose yeah and that there is a fear of losing which i have seen with a bunch of my peers i can talk about that after you uh, oh of course uh, you know you probably have seen a lot more of this than i have at, at my you know at this level but that actually is something that i would not recommend any of the like the juniors or young budding young superstar tennis players to have i think it's key to put yourself out there don't worry about the result i mean exposure is key and i tell all of this to a lot of my a lot of my students is don't worry about winning or losing so much i know it matters and i know a lot of people care about the outcome yeah but the outcome is a function of the level of hard work that you put in, which is in your control, right? But there are some other things which you can't control. You cannot control the opponent's skill set or the kind of ball that they're going to hit. You you can prepare to the best of your abilities, but honestly, it's um, you should uh, not. You should be willing to put yourself out there because you actually learn more from playing more than thinking about, okay, you know what? I don't think I'm going to win this match. So let me not play stuff around, around that. So hey, I have a I tip. Always... I have a tip here. Sorry. Yes. You know, if you yes. don't want, if, if there's a guaranteed way, if you don't want to ever lose, there is a guaranteed way to do it. And you know what that is? Don't show up. Don't play. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there are certain people that I know, who have actually improved a lot by just just playing a lot, and I appreciate that because for me, playing is an opportunity for me to learn. So it's like continuous learning journey that I'm on, and mm -hmm. I want to expose myself. I've always tried to challenge myself. At least I'm talking about my personal experience against people of a lot of times they they are superior to me in terms of like talent. But for me, it doesn't matter. Like I've never shied away from or or being scared. Though you know what, I'm playing some superstar player who has played at you know French Open junior level or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like it's you know what, I'm actually excited. There's one time that I literally showed up. I played this guy who was really really good. I was no match. I was like way beyond below his league. And I actually said, you know what? I'm so thankful that I'm, I have an opportunity to play you. Whether I lose or lose, win or lose is irrelevant. Uh, it's just an opportunity for me to just compete. And, you know, I that's how I sort of train myself to be mentally strong. Of course, results matter. You got to beat the people who you should beat, but you should not be scared to lose because you learn a lot from losses. And this is applicable to me outside of tennis as well. Because I've had a lot of experience where I didn't get what I wanted, but it's taught me a lot. That yeah. Was... So, I, I wish I was like that, <laughs> um, and I think that like some people are like that, and but I I do think that like most people are not, um, and that's why I really think that there's a spectrum, you know, when it comes to your growth and your and your fixed mindset, and so like. For me, like, I don't think I'm ever going to be completely a growth mindset when it comes to tennis. Um, maybe because I have so much history and still I have a little bit of identity in it, you know. 
I think a lot of it has left me, which has actually taken me a lot of work um, because I was very identified with tennis. Um, and I that brings me actually to the topic. And I, I, I think it's easier for you guys because you have so much else that you've done already. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you have had so many different journeys and you've had so much success in different ways. But for the people that tennis was their success, right. tennis was their life. Right. For me, tennis is my life. Tennis was like what people knew me for. It was like they thought I was good at and um, I got positive attention. Right. And I, I never was uh, a top 200 player or anything like that, that I was on TV and and those things. But even like in college, like being on a poster and being on a wall and having some articles and stuff like that, that happens for high school play players already. Right. Yep. Like it really develops for a lot of people um, an identity. And so I think it is, that's where the fear comes from. You don't want to lose that positive attention. Yeah. And so for me, till this day, I have fear when I play tennis, if I have a match, like I, I still double full. Um, part of me is kind of like, are you kidding me? Like you're 35 and you're still getting tight, you know, but it's just what it is. And um, the more that I accept it, uh, the easier that it is. Um, and I think it's the the same for my students. Like, I think it is important, like you said, so hum to keep saying those things because it's true, right? It's just an illusion in our mind that we we are identified. But I also think it's important to, to, to understand that like, yeah, they're going to have nerves a lot of the times. They're going to struggle with those things. Um, and then keep reminding yourself that, hey, like, if you get better, that's all that matters. If you work on the things that you're, you're working on, if you use the tools, uh, meditation, using a towel for the routines, um, slowing down your breath so you're, you're more clear, being positive, being kind to yourself, um, to me, that is really most important. And that's just like an everyday thing. Absolutely. And, you know, rewarding, rewarding yourself for small wins is, yes. is a very good thing because I feel like you, it can only motivate you. Like if, even if you won a set, but you did not, you gave it your best, you won one set, you lost in a three set match, just being positive and looking at things where, you know, you write down what you did good yeah. and looking at things in a brighter way. Yeah. Is, is much better, is more positive way of going about things in general about life. Yeah. Yes. And I've been trying to do that. And you know what? I do that even outside tennis and I'm a lot happier today than I was before. Yeah. And I, I try to do certain things because I've also surrounded myself with wise, secure, you know, uh, positive people. And I, I kind of wanted to mention something before, uh, which this is an opportunity for me to say it is, besides physical fitness and strategy, you know, I really work with my students on the mental aspect and few of the things that I've been doing actually even lately, because a lot of students come to me, you know, they're playing a lot of matches, but some people are not winning. They're like close to winning, but not winning. And, you know, I've been observing some of their trends and I figured out, you know what, I think being a coach, a mentor who is working on their mental aspect of the thing, which is really mm -hmm. hard. It mm -hmm. is essential. So a couple of the drills that I do, one was I did like this uh, without serve 10 point, 10 point like groundy game where I had the opponent uh, be up like 5-0, first to 10. So 5-0 once, then 6-0 once, then 7-0 once. I wanted to test how they play when they're winning. Mm. And all they have to do is get to 10. So if they're five zero up, they need five points. I need ten points. But if they're six zero, I, I, they need four. I need ten. If they're seven zero, they need three. So closing matches is very tough. I've had that problem before happen to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certain drills to kind of train your mind that hey, you know what? Don't get tight. You just got to play loose. Yep. You got to play loose. Stop worrying about ten. Uh, you know, getting to 10, getting to the finish line, just play point by point. Don't have mm -hmm. to worry about the results. So I've been doing this drill yeah. a lot. And I clearly saw the people who were, who were suffering. They're good players, but they're not, you know, uh, forget about the 
the difference in the level between me and my students. These mm-hmm. students are pretty good, right? So I know that they can still beat me. It's it's mm-hmm. a matter of playing three good points if you're seven zero up, and construct the point. It's very strategic visualization of. That's a point. great game. I like that. I I love it because I think it actually helps me too. Mm-hmm. And I saw when I am so I have trained myself to play consistent the same way, irrespective of the score, because that's actually helped me a lot. Mm-hmm. So I did that drill, but I also did a drill where the students are behind. Like I am five zero up. I wanted to see what's the difference, mm-hmm. and I immediately saw with all the students, people who were having trouble closing matches, mm-hmm. is they started playing a lot looser when they're down. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, why don't you play the same way when you're up? And that's one of the things which is what I'm trying to work with, uh, work on with my students. Mm-hmm. And um, personal story for me also has been a f- in the last couple of years, you know. A doubles match, for example, I've been up a set, played outstanding, came out firing on all cylinders, right? Played outstanding for a set and a half. Then all of a sudden, there's a momentum shift. Ships. And mm-hmm. and it's doubles this like so fast. Things, the momentum can shift very quickly. It's also like four people on court, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just on you. So it requires communication. It's like team teamwork and stuff like that. There have been multiple instances, even at practice the other day, I was practicing the exact same thing happened. We were up six, six, three, two, one with a break. We are firing on all cylinders and we ended up losing the match. And it's not because we are playing worse, but it's like you start thinking about the finish line. We're like, yeah. hey, we're so close. We just need four games, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's the third set. You're down again a break and it's, it's such a mental game. And for me, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Any, yeah. Any particular experiences that you have you want to talk about? I wanted to ask Tarun a few things because he's the only parent amongst <laughs> us. Yeah. And I I remember um when I went to meet with you and your son was playing. And I remember like we your son was playing and we were talking. Yeah. And I I was really impressed with like afterwards we went to lunch and you were so chill around him you were just he lost and he played pretty bad um if i remember and he was a little sad but he was not even that sad which i actually think has to do with how you respond because you were just like hey don't worry about it like yeah what do you want for lunch so (laughs) i would like to talk to you about like what do you have as advice for tennis parents because it's not easy yeah it's not easy and and i'm 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 telling you this that we can do a a complete separate podcast on this uh this discussion alone yeah so for parents, it's again, it, it goes back to what uh, the, the thing that you said in the beginning, growth mindset. So uh, I feel that uh, parents uh, should should think of the long-term development of the child. And, you know, tennis is just one activity that the kids are doing. I mean, there is, so I feel that many parents get into this trap of saying that my child is special and, you know, maybe they were a tennis athlete or an athlete, and maybe they are trying to live, go through the tennis journey, uh, you know, their journey through their child. So that is that is a big trap that I feel parents should avoid. Uh, the growth mindset, uh, you know, be there for the child, you know, be there with them. Uh, so there is, uh, so that that's extremely important. Taking losses, losses, winning and losing, like Soham said, very beautifully explained that it's a part of the game. So you have to build that software of, you know, a bank of matches, understanding how to respond to different situations. So, so there is this famous psychological theory. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't look that up. So what it says is that when you're following a team, like when you're a big fan of a team, like Soham is a big 49ers fan, I know that. Uh, and, you know, you could be a fan of your own child, right? If you're playing. So there is this mindset that you always feel that they are vulnerable. You feel that, oh my God, they're going to miss this. They're going to lose this. They're going to drop the ball. This kid, he's going to miss the shot. She's going to miss that shot. So this is, uh, and you know, you, you can even see the coaches and parents uh, in tennis do this. And many of them, you know, that stresses them out. So if you're one of those parents, you know, who gets completely stressed out, it's totally perfectly okay. Drop your child, have them play, walk away, come back and be there for them. And on the car ride back home, you know, have, you know, if they have lost, you know, let them, let them process it. 
and let them talk to you. You have to be supportive. Remember, the, the role of the parent is to be there for the child. I mean, nobody else, coaches can come and go. Parents, no, the, that is that the parents cannot be replaced like that. So, I mean, this is not to say that coaches are lesser, but it's just to say that the parents' role is so important. They Definitely. have to be there to support the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. well said. It's yeah. it's such a team effort, right? Yeah. It's like, it's the parents, it's the coach, and it's the player. Yeah. And then if there might be another coach or the, the yeah. clinic coach or the a fitness Absolutely. trainer, yes. but it all, all is a team. Yes, yeah. And, and on this topic, you know, not... Uh, I wanted to mention this when Soham you talked about in the beginning about tennis is a very very a very very different sport. So I want to quote Jorge Capistani. He is one of the USTA and PTI master professionals. So in one of his podcasts, he made an excellent point that tennis as a sport is extremely unique. You see, because unlike other sports, no coaching allowed. Is there a time limit? There is no time limit. A match can, in theory, go on infinitely. You know, there's some do you... coaching allowed on the WTA right yes, now. Yes, WTA yeah. allowed. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I, I believe coaching should be allowed everywhere because, you know, it, it's very hard on the players. Mm -hmm. There is no time limit. Uh, there is theoretically, there's no time limit. Uh, matches can go on and on and on. Uh, and you have to put the opponent away. Like, it's not like you are 6 0, 5 0 up. In other sports, you can completely, sh you have a big lead. It's easy to protect a big lead and shut your opponent out. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, basketball, fourth quarter, you know, 10, 10 minutes left. You have a like a 25-point lead, match is done. Uh, the players might as well sit. But it's in tennis, it's not like that. You have to game set match happens after you win the match point. So even if you're 6-0, 5-0 up, you have to win the point. There are so many matches where people uh, lose uh, from winning positions, matches, you know, momentum shifts back and forth. So this is... Uh, I think Jorge uses the word diabolical. Our scoring system is truly diabolical because it's extremely challenging. You have to put your opponent away. So I just wanted to bring that perspective because it's an extremely adversarial sport. You go back and forth, you respond to situations and the scoring system uh, makes for a long contest which gives you opportunities to come back. So you have to put the opponent away and win the match point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, Tarun. I, I really, I, I learned a lot from, you know, what you just said. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I want to kind of bring up is the, well, from what I have observed and, you know, speaking about the way I play too, is yeah. personality. Like, yeah. I feel like the way people play on court says a lot about their personality in general. Yes. For me, I can say that, you know, I'm not, I'm not born with some tennis, you know, talent. I, I, I am, I am, I guess I love sports and I play a lot of sports. So I have a flair, a talent for sports, but I'm not like a natural tennis player. So I've had to work hard at tennis, whether it's through physical fitness, whether it's to learning technicals, asking a bunch of questions and being curious. But one of the things is the way I play is, is actually a good, uh, reflection of me as a person. I'm very, uh, there are some good and bad things about this. So in general, I'm a very detailed oriented person. Uh, it comes from my Virgo traits. Uh, <laughs> and the problem yeah. with this is you can become too involved in the details yeah. and start worrying about being perfect. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a problem. Like, yeah. Fortunately, I don't think I have that problem about trying to be perfect mm -hmm. because I know that if flaws is, if you have flaws, it's an opportunity for you to improve. You're trying to get better. We are not some professionals here. Yeah. So I don't expect to be perfect. And even mm -hmm. Federer, Novak, Djokovic, or Nadal, they're not perfect. Everybody has some flaw that they're constantly trying to work on. Mm -hmm. And this is where being mentally disciplined is very important yep. so i realize that i have certain things which i i'm not very good at and just accepting that fact is a big thing for me right like mm -hmm. it, it helps me be more secure about yeah yeah about yep. like when i'm on court yes i'm very detail-oriented i'm very hard-working that's how i am in my life too it's a good reflection of 
the way I operate outside outside of the court. And I like I kind of enjoy that. I feel like I don't want to change that. Like I don't want to become like you know uh, showboating my skills or doing trick shots or mm-hmm. I respect the people who have the ability to do that. I don't, but mm-hmm. I I feel like and I want to ask you know Alex, what are your thoughts about it? Like do the way you play is it a reflection of how you are as a person outside the court? Mm, absolutely, I, I I do really believe in that as well. Um, like, just like you, like, I'm also a Virgo, <laughs> yeah. um, but like detail oriented, I, I am also detail oriented and analytical. I'm extremely analytical. And so that is my strength and my weakness, <laughs> um, my strength, because like, I, I'm thinking about it all. And I'm seeing so many things and I, I just, my, my wheels are spinning. Um, but then it's important for me to let go and to trust but so yeah the that reflects to me as a player um working really hard um also being a grinder um also playing chess i'm definitely a chess player on the court and um but it also reflects reflects on me personality that i'm not as aggressive as i would like to be on the court and so for me, that actually goes back a little bit to the, the fear of failure a little bit. But then also I have this growth mindset that I'm, I'm learning to grow and I've learned to grow. So I have found ways to be more aggressive, to use my foreign more, to have strategies, to find their weaknesses, to come to the net, um, which comes from my analytic skills and my desire to improve. But um, I think it also brings it in like with with people when you're coaching them you know if students with players like some are just like like us like really hard workers and you actually have to like be more positive towards them because a lot of times they're really hard on themselves mm-hmm. and it's it's usually pretty obvious you know it comes all together with like it's more of an energetic type and that it needs to be better and they're always looking for it to be better and um mm-hmm. but they're usually also stressed you know, and, and there's some results oriented uh, thinking too. Then you sometimes have like people that are very talented and and you can also be a hard worker and talented, but I'm also talking about the players that are very talented and they, they don't necessarily work as hard. And then it's like, okay, how do you, how do you talk to them and how do you work with that? Um, and then you have also the people that they just have different dreams. They, their, their reason for playing which is a very important point. Um, their reason for playing is maybe very different than what you think it is or what you would like it to be. And so it's important for the parent, for the coach to become aware of what is the why of the, the person, the player. Sweet. And that has been a real big lesson for me as a coach um, because I always wanted them to do better and I wanted more for them. And that was not always, and of course, everyone is trying to get better, but my thinking was always like, well, they can go all this way. Like, you know, if you just do this and you do this and this and this, like you can really like improve your level this much. And now it's more of like adapting to what they actually really want and talking about that and, and then figuring out how I can assist in that, uh, which is still a journey for me. Uh, because my tendency is to to push them, you know, and to push them harder. Um, but I think that's really important. What is your why? And and also for parents, like becoming, because if you give ownership, if the person has more ownership, they will want more, right? If they are in an environment, so ownership and environment is the number one. And so if you can create ownership for the player, this is the job of the player, the coach and the parents. And because like if the coach even takes away that ownership, that push, the, the players are not empowered. They're not going to feel like I'm doing this. I decided that. I figured it out. I wanted that um, because that gives autonomy. And the environment is very important too because you get motivated by being around other players you get motivated because you see something that you really enjoy you get motivated because that coach is just really inspiring absolutely um, so, yeah yeah those two which brings me actually to a little story that where i learned that 
when I worked for the USTA and I went to Palm Springs, I was invited to work with Jose Hagueras, um, who was like the main guy, main guy for USTA. Uh, he was the one that created the philosophy for USTA when I worked there. And so a few coaches were invited to learn under him. And the players were Katie Volinats, Coco Goff, Caroline Dolheide, um, and Lee, and there might be an H- Haley Baptiste. And it was one week just watching Jose train them, and then we would drill with them, but we would really like just listen to what he had to say. And it was really interesting because like he created the environment, right? You have four or five coaches there. You have great players, and it's on clay court in Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. doesn't get better. And there were two dogs in the middle, which was also <laughs> funny. Um, but then he just said to them, he's like, it's whoever wants it. If you guys want to get water, you get water. But whoever wants it, we're here. We're here ready to work. If you guys want water after five minutes, you get water after five minutes. And they were just doing cross courts and just inside out, like just simple stuff. And he just gave them everything and they worked so hard. No one wanted to get water. <laughs> and he talked about that. And I, I really walked away thinking like, that's that's it. One of the things I, I wanted to touch upon, I mean, first of all, that's a great story, uh, Alex. Um, fascinating. And, you know, Listening to you, I feel like, you know, we could go on and on about yep, personal yep. stories. Absolutely. And like we can learn from each other, which is wonderful, right? And I just had one thing that I wanted to talk about because I think it's very important. We see that amongst the pro players too. You know, no human being is perfect. We all come with our flaws, right? And we respect each other with our flaws. And I'm talking about not just even tennis. You know, you can talk about partners, friends, whatever. Now, one of the areas of... Uh, interest to me to talk about and discuss because I've seen it in person and I've, you know, is the emotions that people show. Now, some people don't show a lot of emotions. Some people are very expressive. I come from the school of thought, and this is how I'm in person too, that I'm very expressive. If there is something that is, if I want to scream, I'll scream. If I, I, I'm talking about like, now let's say, put it in perspective, context, I'm talking about on the tennis court. If I feel like I want to scream, I'll scream. If I want to, uh, you know, uh, pump my, you know, like do a fist pump or whatever, or just pump myself up, I'll do it because it gives me energy. Now, the thing is, you don't want to do certain things which actually are negative energy to you. Mm-hmm. The key is using things which positively give you some energy and you can do it with some emotions. I'm a, I'm kind of an emotional player. So if I hit a shot, I'll say, come on, right? Like it, I need that drive and that energy, but I, I've also previously have also been very upset when I made a mistake, uh, which means I screamed or, you know, I have uh, been upset. You know, I did a bunch of things. I have, I've thrown my racket. Or I sh- should not do you know i strongly recommend players not to do it i i'm much much better at that now i hardly do it but i've done it in the past because that was my way of showing some emotion but then i realized there are certain things which actually hurt you negative like it's a negative emotion and as a result of that your game suffers you don't want to do that so i've become more mature in the way i i handle my emotions on course but it's still a work in progress for me I want to ask you, because I think you have played at the highest level. Uh, how do you deal with emotions? Because that's actually kind of tied to mindset too. Mm-hmm. Definitely. No, it's a great topic. I mean, that's been, I, I definitely had a temperament. Um, like I, I'm just laughing because I, I'm, if some people watch this that, that have seen me play, they'll, <laughs> they'll be like, well, yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, it was a, a lot of learning to 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 work with my emotions and till this day if i'm in a match like i i will also fist bump and i i have i'm an emotional player as well um my my example has been rafa nadal in that um because he's an emotional player he has a lot of energy and so he's very positive right and he has yes. trained himself to be so positive and so for me that's what I've always strived to do. And that's what I've done for big parts of my, my playing. Um, but I've definitely had some phases that I, I was in some darker, darker hole in it. 
And I, I remember that at, at St. Mary's, for example, some players had to do sprints because of me, you know, and there were certain punishments. And then that I had to really like learn to, because it's addicting, you know, if you, yeah. if you get mad at yourself, it's like, you're, it's a habit. And so you have to really unlearn that habit. And it's not, if you have been throwing your, like throwing your racket, which I don't recommend, but if you've been throwing your racket or have been getting mad, like you've been doing that so much that you're not going to just like do it, stop doing it. You have yeah. to now practice, stop like being positive. And it might take you a few days to become more positive. It's like, are you going this way or are you going this way? Are you going up or are you going down? Um, so the, I'm very aware because of that, because I, I it, it's been such a thing for me. And so I always tell my students, I'm like, just so you know, like if you need to let it out and just yell, just yell, like be pissed, but then let yourself work on being positive again. Yeah. Don't get stuck in that cycle. The next point is what the most important thing is. The next ball, the next point, you got to train your mind. You know, mm. so, yes. Like walk away, have a towel, you know, kind of just breathe in, breathe out. There are lots of things to do. Smile, you know, maybe if you, mm. if you missed a point, just smile and just laugh it off. Like move mm -hmm. on, right? It's like you got to move on because the next point is the most important point in tennis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 for me it's a work in progress i think i'm becoming a lot better at it and uh you know harming the racket or like hitting yourself stuff like that which i've seen mm -hmm. is not the solution because mm -hmm. it just pushes you away from your goal and objective which is to win the match a mm -hmm. lot of time so you got to refocus and it's much harder when you start doing things which which are negative emotions so yeah i think self awareness uh, emotions are all vital vital aspects of handling your handling the brain and uh, the brain game and i think we have covered a lot in this uh, episode i think there's a lot more we we have to cover as well which yes. is why i think we are going to have a part 2 of this where probably we're going to talk about how do you win a game from a from a very somewhat technical as uh, technical standpoint too yep. uh because again the tennis is a very mental game right right you have and one of the things that one of you said earlier is in singles tennis, at least you're on your own. So it's so much harder. And I feel like a lot of tennis players don't get the respect. A lot of singles tennis players don't get the respect that they should because tennis is such a daunting, it's such a difficult sport. Like you have to be so mentally strong. And I can't even imagine what the pro players go through. Uh, it's it's incredible. Like I would love to talk to some pro, you know, current active pro players. You know, what do they do? And hopefully, we get that opportunity in in some of the future episodes. Yes. Um, but at least in doubles, you have one person. You know, one person can come. They can help you through it. It's more of a teamwork, lots of communication. Right. But again, there's so many things that we can talk about. Uh, Tarun, you know. I would love for you to kind of have some final words to say because uh, uh, what are what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm sure you and you, uh, you know, we spoke. Alex and I spoke a lot. You know, anything yeah. that you want to say to close the episode? Oh yes, it's it's yeah. This was a very fascinating discussion. So just like I learned so much, like about how how you guys um, you know walked us everybody through the topics of you know self-awareness communication you know managing your energy it's it's this is something that even i try to apply for my matches so like you talked about you know player personalities right i am more of a you know i'm a uh, i'm a pisces so i'm more of a, <laughs> i like creative tennis <laughs> more artistry so so consequently most of my points are very short <laughs> so <laughs> let's put it that way but but the thing is uh, you know, but that helps me in doubles. So I, I'm able to kind of, you know, visualize patterns and, you know, target players, areas of the court, you know, play high percentage, you know, pattern matching driven tennis. So, yeah, so these are topics, I think, which we are definitely going to cover in the part two, where, which is going to be more about strategy, patterns, you know, match management and things like that. So, yeah, so this episode was, I mean, this is an amazing discussion. I, and I, I hope that uh, lots of our viewers and listeners uh, are able to kind of, uh, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, we didn't go dive too much detail, but we're able to get a broad overview on, you know, what mental tennis 
uh, what are the aspects of mental tennis? And one of the things that I'll just add to what Tarun said, who, you know, you beautifully put it. I think in, in tennis hackery, in our journey, uh, in all of our podcasts so far, we want to keep it very relatable. Like yes. we want to, we want, we are trying to cater to people who, who mm -hmm. are, you know, a lot of them are recreational players. A lot of our friends who, who can relate to what we are saying, because yes. I, I guess one of our uh, uniqueness in this whole thing is, you know, we, we want to be relatable. So please do comment uh, besides subscribing and all of that, because we will be coming out with great content. And uh, we would love to hear some of your comments. And, you know, one of, we could, we are thinking about it, but potentially we could uh, have a live, we could go live on Instagram or YouTube and we could uh, maybe talk to some of our fans and take some of their questions. And yeah. uh, if you put some of your contents out, please reach out to us uh, on our, uh, on our Instagram, Facebook, or uh, Meta or, or Twitter accounts. Right. And I guess that's about it with the uh, uh, episode number four, part one. So there is episode number five will be part two of Mental Tennis. So again, uh, please do follow us on all our socials at Tennis Hackery is the handle. So like Soham mentioned, we are on all the social platforms. And uh, um, uh, the, the one fun fact that I wanted to mention, which I was discouraged from mentioning, is that we are expecting. So I was looking at some of the numbers, channel numbers. So we were around a grand total of 11 subscribers in the previous episode. Now we have grown, we, it's 40, it's 40 plus, not plus 50, but it's 40 plus. So we have grown almost 4X. So going by this, we will hit the 500 limit in probably, if you're growing 4X, so what, 40, 160, and then 640. <laughs> so another two weeks, two to three weeks, we are going to hit 500. So the TikTok dance rehearsals have already started. So we will be on TikTok in uh, about, let's say three weeks, assuming, uh, such a geometric progression so yep you need to start uh, start to get my <laughs> dancing shoes on yep soon <laughs> <laughs> all right guys uh any any closing words from you alex no i'm excited for episode yeah. two yeah second section um yeah. we're gonna go into more like the parts in the match and the practice like the tools and you know make it more practical so stay tuned stay tuned that see you all next time bye Bye, guys. Adios. Bye.